Madame, Monsieur, bonjour. Je suis très heureux d'être parmi vous dans cette nouvelle émission. Le sujet de cette émission traite de la légalisation thérapeutique du cannabis au Maroc. Comme vous le savez, suite à une série de recommandations par l'Organisation mondiale de la santé, l'ONU, ou la commission plutôt des stupéfiants de, de l'ONU, a décidé de retirer le cannabis de l'annexe 4 de la résolution, ou plutôt de la convention de 1961 sur les stupéfiants, dans laquelle le cannabis était considéré comme les autres drogues mortelles et addictives. Alors l'OMS a décidé finalement que cette drogue n'était pas si mortelle que cela et n'était pas si addictive que cela. Euh, à la suite de cela, le Maroc a changé de stratégie. Euh, au, si au début des années 2000, euh, le Maroc a fait en sorte à, à limiter la, la, la culture du cannabis euh, avec des études et, 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 et des solutions de, de culture de rechange, euh, aujourd'hui la politique du Maroc a changé dans la mesure où euh, on, on, on a euh, élaboré un, une, une loi au Maroc qui a été votée au Parlement en mai euh, 2021. Euh, cette loi émane de plusieurs études, de recherches euh, sur le terrain, dans une démarche participative. Euh, ce projet de loi, il faut bien le signaler, concerne uniquement l'aspect thérapeutique, euh, euh, médical, euh, cosmétique, industriel. Euh, L'aspect récréatif reste, euh, lui, euh, euh, puni par la loi, bien évidemment. Alors, cette loi, elle concerne un certain nombre de... ou elle comprend un certain nombre de volets. Euh, la culture euh, de la et la production du cannabis, la création et l'exploitation euh, des, des plantations de cannabis, euh, l'importation, l'exportation, euh, la transformation, l'industrialisation, le transport, euh, le marketing et la commercialisation euh, du, du cannabis, euh, l'octroi de licences euh, également, euh, la, la, euh, la durée de validité, les conditions d'octroi, euh, de refus, euh, etc. Et euh, cette loi comprend également les dispositions de la création d'un régulateur, d'une agence publique pour veiller à l'implémentation et à la mise en place des volets de, qu'on vient de, de citer. Alors, pour parler de ce sujet important, nous avons demandé l'invitation d'un responsable marocain, mais un droit de réserve l'a empêché d'être euh, parmi nous. Euh, nous n'avons pas baissé les bras. Nous avons invité une grande spécialiste euh, du domaine. Euh, elle est en ligne euh, avec nous. Je, je vous la présenterai euh, un peu plus tard. Euh, euh, nous avons la, la possibilité euh, d'en parler euh, et, et de partager des expériences dans d'autres pays. Alors, euh, j'ai le plaisir aujourd'hui de recevoir Madame euh, euh, Leslie Angel King. Elle est avec nous de l'État euh, d'Arizona, aux États-Unis, euh, d'une jolie ville qui s'appelle Scottsdale. Euh, euh, Madame Angel King est présidente euh, de la Fondation des normes unifiées du cannabis. Euh, en anglais, c'est la Fondation de, euh, of Cannabis Unified Standards. Et on gardera l'acronyme FOCUS pour le reste de euh, l'émission. Euh, Madame euh, Leslie Angel King est dans le domaine de la santé depuis euh, euh, quelques années. Elle était également dans le business du cannabis thérapeutique. Elle a laissé tomber ses intérêts financiers dans ce domaine pour créer en 2014 euh, la fondation euh, Focus. Euh, euh, Madame Leslie euh, Angel King et, 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 et ses partenaires dans cette euh, fondation euh, offrent des prestations de conseils, euh, d'accompagnement pour les organisations publiques ou privées dans le domaine euh, du cannabis thérapeutique. Voilà. Uh, uh, Leslie, how are you doing? It's nice to have you in the show. Thank you so much for having me. I'm doing well and I'm really excited about the opportunity uh, to talk to you today. Great to have you. I know that your time is very, very precious. You are traveling around the world to share your expertise and your experiences. Uh, and it's, it's a great... Uh, 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 great to have you today, really, really, I, I really appreciate it. So wh what I was saying, uh, Leslie, is that uh, following a series of recommendations uh, from the World Health Organization, uh, the United Nations Commission on Narcotic Drug 
drug CND has decided to remove cannabis uh, from Annex 4 of the Convention 1961 um, on narcotics. Uh, on this uh, annex, the cannabis was listed alongside other deadly and addictive drugs. So the World Health Organization decided finally that uh, cannabis is not uh, daily addictive that much. And following this, Morocco changed its policy from uh, uh, fighting or repression. Uh, we changed the policy into legalization, not dependization, but legalization. The, uh, only the therapeutic uh, 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 cannabis wa was legalized. So the process was uh, based on some feasibility studies. Uh, it started early 2000, so there were some updates on the studies and, and research. Uh, uh, it, it was a, a, an inclusive approach. Uh, uh, all the stakeholders were, were consulted, and uh, finally we got a bill uh, that was sponsored by the Ministry of Interior of Morocco. Uh, in the US, I think it's the, it's the equivalent of the Homeland uh, Security uh, Office. And this bill was deb debated, I mean, uh, during a long time in the Moroccan parliament. Uh, there were passionate and fascinating debates. And uh, finally, the, the law was adopted on May 2021. And this law was about, uh, or is about, uh, the, the legal use of cannabis, the medical, cosmetic, and industrial, and the recreational use remains prohibited and liable to prosecution, of course. So the, the, this law defends some aspects, including the creation and operation of cannabis plantation, the import and export, the processing and distribution, uh, the marketing, uh, some point like that, and also the uh, insurance of licensing, the uh, period of validity, the conditions to, uh, for the refusal, withdrawal, etc. And also this uh, law includes the provisions for the creation of a public agency, a kind of regulator, for, to implement and monitor all the aspects uh, mentioned before. Uh, and uh, you ha we have you today, we have the chance to have you today to talk about, about that. Uh, I said that you have been in the healthcare field for several, several years. Um, you also were in therapeutic cannabis business. You dropped all your financial interest in this field to create focus in 2014. And in this foundation, you and your staff, you are uh, offering consulting support ser services for public and private organizations um, in the field of therapeutic cannabis. Um, to me, uh, Leslie, you have covered all the aspects of um, <laughs> the social aspect, the, the policy aspect, the economic aspect. I think you are the right person to talk to about this topic, and I'm really happy to have you today. So my first question, I, I talked about you in, in a few words. Can you tell us, please, Leslie, about your professional background, about focus, uh, and all the things you, you do in, in, in this field? Thank you very much. Absolutely, um, and thank you for that very kind introduction. Um, so my background, initially, um, I, I worked in mental health and public health. And through the work in mental health, um, trying to change the stigma around depression and mental illness, I met the folks from Eli Lilly and Company Pharmaceuticals and ended up working with them for 13 years on a lot of the same stuff, working to change the stigma, change laws, parity for mental health care. And I also did sales. And um, just loved it. I didn't expect to love it, but I really was just so excited about being able to help people and, and really improve their lives and help these physicians treat their patients better and, and all of that. Um, when I left Lilly, Arizona had just legalized where I live um, for medical cannabis use, not recreational, but medical. And some friends wanted to apply for a license here. And I said no, adamantly at first, because I don't know anything about cannabis. My parents are defense attorneys and public health experts. Mm -hmm. And to me, it was just such a foreign idea back in 2011, you know, 2010. So 
they eventually convinced me of all the medical benefits and how much cannabis was helping people. And so I agreed to take on the role of and go through this application process with them. We were fortunate enough to apply for and win the first license in Phoenix, Arizona, uh, which is the capital. And every license in Arizona is called vertically integrated. So it means that one license allows you to grow and produce cannabis. It allows you to manufacture and process. It allows you to package, distribute, and also sell. Um, I was there for three years and, and so convinced through my experience about the benefits of cannabis. I mean, I was hearing it every single day from patients. Um, but I was really concerned because in the United States, cannabis is federally illegal. And so the programs have developed at the state level and each state sort of develops, they follow this previous state's regulatory structure as they develop their programs. So we've created a, a system in the US of failed programs that just mimic one another across the country. Um, not to say that they're not partially successful. Um, and so I, I realized the reason that this was happening is because in a normal industry, anything to control for quality and safety and, and guidance for business operators on how to make safe, consistent products usually comes from the federal government. But because cannabis didn't, it's been developed by states and their emphasis is on testing products for safety but without giving any guidance or education to operators about how to run their business on a day-to-day -day basis to make sure that their products are safe and consistent and of good quality. Um, as standards are the international language for trade, it seemed pertinent to me that we have standards specific to the needs and nomenclature of the cannabis industry so that as this industry grows into the global market it is quickly becoming, we have standards as a baseline for trade, for assuring quality and safety, and for, for you know. Leslie, Leslie, sorry, I would like to interrupt you. So when you are talking about standard, it's federal standard, is the federal government who implement this, or it's the, uh, if I'm not wrong, you are in Arizona, right? So are, are they related to the state of Arizona or are, are they federal standards? So every single state in the US has different cannabis regulations. Okay. They don't call things the same thing. They don't require the same thing from operators. They don't allow cannabis to be used for the same conditions. They don't allow the same products. So we literally have 37 state experiments and no connectivity from a federal level. Okay. Um, and, and that's problematic. And, and so, and again, if you think about good manufacturing practice guidelines and standards for food or agriculture or any other commodity that's traded and, and globally exchanged, there are guidelines for operators. And it's usually the federal agencies that license those operators that provide those, but that didn't happen in cannabis. And so I left my job running the, the marijuana company, medical marijuana company in Arizona to start focus so that we could step in and basically take the place of the federal government by creating these standards and developing a system for trade for products internationally. Okay, thank you very much for that. And um, I have a question about the UN process. So why did UN take so long time uh, to remove cannabis? Why today? What has changed in the uh, World Health Organization approach? So I think there's a few things to consider when we're, un we're trying to understand this. And I think the first and probably most important is big ships turn very slowly. And the United Nations and the World Health Organization are both very large organizations or ships. So the process of change is just a lengthy one by definition through those types of organizations. That said, the conventions of 61 and 71 and the annexes are based on data that we had then. And it, this is, I think it was 2018 was the first time that the WHO has actually looked at any of the cannabis scheduling 
um, what it's being used for, the outcomes of, of drug policy around the world. Um, and what they found is that we really need that the drug policies in general are not preventing harm. They're causing more problems than they are helping people. They're, we are criminalizing drug use and addiction and things like this. Um, and so part of that needed to change. And so the expert committee on drug dependence, which is ECDD, which is a group of medical and public health experts under the, under the WHO, um, came together and said, we're gonna look at all the data that exists and we're going to recommend a more rational approach to the regulation of drugs in general, but cannabis specifically, that's based on public health outcomes and safety and not on the criminalization. So um, cannabis was kind of the first step. We have um, clinical data and outcome information that we didn't have 30 years ago, right? Um, I think also the state of the world and the climate crisis is a big driver for the UN on the industrial side, right? Um, I think you gotta appreciate cannabis for the regenerative agriculture and, and soil remediation properties that it can help in farming other crops around the world. Um, and then I think also the interest from other industries, the pharmaceutical industries, the, you know, the insurance industries, those kind of things getting are, are interested now. And so all of that sort of led up to this decision and, and this action. Um, unfortunately, there's, you know, the, the way, I, don't, I mean, I don't wanna get too into you and policies and all of that, but there are, you know, each country receives money from UN based on following their policies and things like that. And some of the biggest, the top five or six biggest stakeholders for the UN that vote on this are, are still very much against it. And they tend to be countries like the US that have very prohibitive drug laws that are sort of archaic and out of date, but <clears throat> there's systems, political systems around them. Um, so I, I think it's a great first step. And I think that it is so important that the discussion started and has gone where it is. It is just a small portion of where we need to go. Yeah, be, because if I, I'm not wrong, the, the, the cannabis was just removed from, removed from Annex 4 to Annex 1, if I'm not wrong, right? Yeah. That was the process, yeah. right? Okay. So before talking about the, the Moroccan approach or the Moroccan experience, um, uh, what are the form of medicinal uh, cannabis can we see in, in the worldwide ma market? What, what are the use for that? What, uh, are you asking in Morocco specifically or just? No, around, around, around the world, what, what, yeah, around the world and maybe in the US because you, are, you have, uh, I, I mean, you can, uh, we can get some insight from you yeah, about the US. We can speak to the US and globally. We work in, in 29 states and 13 countries right now. So I've got part of the benefit of my organization is that we've got the experience and we've learned lessons from each of the different programs that we've worked with. And so we're really able to guide a new country in the development of a program the right way. Um, so I'm happy to talk about both, but I think in general, medicinal products, I mean, in the US, if you look at the only products that have cannabis in them that are approved at the federal level are pharmaceutical products that have gone through the traditional, you know, placebo controlled, double blind, gold standard type of trial. Um, and that's seizures, a very specific type of seizures um, for anti-nausea, effects from chemotherapy. Mm -hmm. um, but those are the very tiny ways cannabis is being used in the US is those drugs that are FDA approved. The majority of use comes from the state medical programs or the state recreational programs. And patients are using cannabis for medical concerns such as chronic pain, that tends to be the highest one, right? Like there's no real good solution for chronic pain. We've got an opioid epidemic going across the globe. Cannabis doesn't have those same risks. So a lot of that. Um, we also see a lot of use for social anxiety, depression, stress, um, that sort of thing. We see a lot of use for- Multiple sclerosis maybe? Multiple Sorry? Multiple sclerosis, maybe? Yeah. Yeah. 
And then, and then post-traumatic stress disorder, right? So veterans and, and other people who have suffered traumatic experiences that can't seem to get over them, um, really use it to alleviate some of the, the anxiety and the mm -hmm. replication of those memories and that kind of stuff. Um, but I think there's, I mean, not to mention all the people that use it therapeutically that are going undergoing other medical treatments for surgery or cancer or, or things like that. Yeah. Um, okay, back to the, the, the Morrigan approach. Any comment on that? Uh, um, in your opinion, what are the things that uh, Morocco should focus on uh, to make it successful? And uh, an underlying question, what other things to, to avoid for Morocco to make it successful? So we were fortunate enough to be hosted in Morocco, uh, a couple of folks from my team and some colleagues, in October, and we spent about 10 days um, driving the country, learning about the history of Morocco, the religious practices, the belief systems, the topography, the climate, the existing trade regulations, the imports and export strengths, currency, and got to know the entire country so that we could help make the right recommendations for Morocco. I think that the most important thing for any new cannabis program is to take adequate time up front to think through the process. So what we see quite often, is, and certainly in the US, but in other countries too, they'll sort of rush to get a program put in place or a law passed because they see the economic and societal impact it will have, and they want that understandably. But that rush prevents them from really doing any kind of proper planning and preventative sort of actions. And so what we see is a program will come into place, doesn't matter where in the world or what state or what country, and it changes dramatically for the first three to four years. Like the legislators, parliament, all that regulators always are working to change that. That's because they're usually copying the mistakes of another system and they haven't built the system that's specific to their country and their needs. So in Morocco, a perfect example is, you know, Morocco's got a long history of exporting food around the world, right? They're one of the largest exporters to the UK and, and other products. Um, they have a history of up in the northern region of all the cannabis farmers that have been, you know, considered outside of the law and and sort of removed from the, the public resources um, that are, you know, even illegally still supply 60% of the world's hash today. Um, there are there's all that institutional knowledge in those folks that have been doing this for hundreds of years in Morocco. They, those people need to be included in the program from the beginning if the country is going to see the economic and societal benefits that it's looking for. So for, for example, in Morocco, it is critical before we let in big business and industry, outside industry come in and start, you know, pharma companies and manufacturers and retailers that we spend some time training and educating the farmers that exist in Morocco today on good manufacturing practices and make sure that they have the resources and the experience that they can produce safe, quality, consistent products that can then be the basis for the entire system in Morocco. If we don't stop and educate them first, other business will come in and just say, well, I'll spend a bunch of money and build my own farm, right? And that's not the intent of the law. The law is a socio and economic benefit for the country. And so it's very, very important to, to think through the specifics of each country and, and what impact they're looking to make ahead of time and make sure that you're, you're putting, you know, goals or, or key performance index, indices throughout so that you're, you're building a program intentionally and not just upstanding another program like the last one. Okay, so if I'm not wrong, your idea is farmer first, right? It's, it's local community. Local communities, yeah. In this case, the farmers are the local community primarily, but yeah. Uh -huh. So you know that in Morocco, you told me that you visited Morocco and you went to the north, the reef region. Um, 
so uh, there are only five or six provinces, the, the equivalent of provinces, counties, only five or six counties yeah. in Morocco. So uh, have you been in touch with the community, local community? Did you talk to the civil society? Because uh, was I, uh, what I was told is that the, 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 the Moroccan approach is an inclusive approach. Everyone is consulted, all the, the communities. Did you see any, any uh, contest about that, anything? Uh, uh, any community who were not uh, consulted or any of that? When we were invited there. We spoke at the Cannabis Congress conference, which was put on by a bunch, of, all the different universities in Morocco were there, the health agencies, the regulatory agencies, like ministries and those kind of things, mm -hmm. as well as the local farmers and co-ops from different the different regions. The, the conference was actually in Tangier, um, and so through that, we got to speak with all the different facets of, you know, this industry from a Moroccan perspective. Um, the, and I think when it, when it comes to the law and you're saying the law is the intent of the law was to do all these things. I believe that that is absolutely the intent of the law. The challenge and, and the issue is that what is written as the intent of a law rarely shows up in real life when you implement the program. And so it's this key time between we've implemented a law or we've passed a law to we're going to start implementing the law where this really in-depth pre-planning needs to happen. And, and it's cannabis touches everything, right? It's food, it's ag, it's produce. I mean, it's pharma, it's, you know, all these different things, industrial stuff. So you have to look at all those existing trade systems. You need to look at bilateral pharmaceutical trade agreements with other countries. You need to figure out a, what kind of export systems are in place now so that you can utilize those same systems and you're not going to create all new infrastructure just to add a cannabis program into your regulatory system, right? Uh -huh. It doesn't need to be. It should work cohesively with your existing systems. Uh -huh. Okay, following this, um, can you tell us, uh, I mean, based on your experience, Leslie, can you tell us about a success story of uh, uh, I mean, uh, a case around the world, uh, a country uh, that have the same economic challenges like Morocco, who uh, make it legal. Uh, any any experience? Can you share with that? Uh, or, or maybe a, a U.S. state? I mean, and also all the. I think it's it's when you're thinking about cannabis, U.S. cannabis versus the rest of the world outside the U.S. cannabis. It's important to understand that each state is like its own country in the US. So we every you go to Arizona and you have the program rules and you go to New Jersey and you have different program rules or you go to the next state New Mexico and you have different rules. And so it's a huge challenge for operators. Um, what you're saying, sorry, so what you're showing is very difficult to make it common to all the countries to all the that yeah that is the intent of the standards is so that if somebody says this is this product and it ha it has this effect and it's for this type of condition that that is the same okay and because if we can't talk about the same we're not even using the same language right so in one state they call it medical cannabis in other states they call it marijuana in other states they just say cannabis it's it's you know some states say hemp it's all over and so that that lack of continuity and consistency is making it so difficult for the industry to succeed so but what can we imagine one day uh, an international standard, standardization uh, uh, organization for that, uh, for, for cannabis? That is what focus is. That is exactly what we do. So when I left the, the can medical cannabis company that I was running, I started focus as a 501c3, so a, a, a philanthropy nonprofit foundation as a health and safety organization for cannabis and the whole intent everything you know our mission is protecting public health consumer safety and the environment in the cannabis industry our standards are global they're based on world health organization and world trade organization guidelines for 
good ag collection practices, good manufacturing, good production, good distribution. We took into consideration all ISO standards, so management system, um, certification, environmental health and safety, food safety. We looked at U.S. Code of Federal Regulations for food, for pharma, for occupational health and safety, and global cannabis regulations. So the intent is to have a standard that can be used around the world. Now, there will be multiple standards. Focus was the first organization to start this, but there's already other organizations getting in there, getting in the space. And so the goal is to, to find cohesiveness between those standards and so that, yes, we can all work under one system or that there's at least, at the very least, like mutual recognition agreements like we have in other industries with different countries. Okay. Uh, so an underlying question. Uh, as you know, um, there is a free trade agreement between Morocco and the US. And do you think possible for Moroccan uh, therapeutic product of cannabis uh, can be uh, uh, interested or uh, the US market can be interested on the uh, Moroccan product and under what conditions? Uh, uh, for example, are your standardization uh, coming from your organization enough? to do that or uh, should uh, uh, companies from Morocco deal with the federal uh, I, I mean office? How could that be possible? So I think multiple questions there, but like will the, in, will the US be interested in Moroccan products? I think the answer is a resounding yes, absolutely. Um, we have a long history of actually working together, the US and Morocco. Um, I didn't realize this, but I learned when I was there in our trip in October that Morocco was the first country to actually recognize the United States as a sovereign nation when we split right. um, and sent beef cows to help with our infrastructure and get, you know, get our industries going and, and all of this. So there's no question that Morocco and the US will trade for cannabis. The challenge is until it's federally legal in the US, nothing can come in or out of any state. So even in if you run a cannabis business in Arizona and you want to sell your products in another state, you can't do it because there's no federal oversight. Okay. So right now that also means that if you are in any other country like Canada or anything that has legalized cannabis, you can't import it to the U.S. yet. And so until our federal government changes, that won't be permitted. But there's absolutely every reason to believe the products will be accepted. We are already seeing so much growth with Moroccan oil, like olive oils and the argan oils that go in the cosmetics and, and different things. So it, it, there's no reason to think that it won't. Okay. Uh... Lastly, we, we come to the, um, to the end of this pleasant exchange and uh, it's customary on this show to, uh, to uh, let the guest has the last word, le, le dernier mot. So your last, <laughs> what will be your last word for the American community and for any, uh, I don't know, uh, startup uh, willing to do business in the therapeutic business of cannabis what are the steps? What are the, the right word for this community? So I think the last word that I would probably say, whether it's to industry wanting to get involved or regulatory or the public in Morocco is that focus is here to help. We have done this around the world. We have learned the hard way and watched others make terrible mistakes that have cost them so much, um, not just financially, but just the stress and headaches and the safety risks and that, that um, we don't wanna see Morocco make those same mistakes. We don't wanna see Morocco take a long time to develop their program. And we, we're here to help in any way we can to make sure that the Moroccan cannabis program is developed and actually achieves the goal and intent that the law was written under. Okay. Okay, Leslie, uh, Angel, thank you. I, I, I remind that you are the president and CEO of the Foundation of Cannabis Unified Sonar Focus. Thank you very much for being in with us and uh, keep up the, the great job to help communities around the world and, and this field. Thank you very thank much, you. Leslie. Have a good day. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.